Nice. Oh, I like that. All right, so that's done. All right, so here we go. Parathyroid disease. So, um, this is going to be not as long. Um, this will be closer to an hour. Um, but um, the thing about parathyroid for um, uh, question and answer, literally, there are some very predictable moments in this talk, and I will identify those for you for uh, multiple choice questions, okay? Uh, some of the other things I'll do are obviously very important prep, and this will be available to you as we talk um, for your reference for prep preparing for oral boards. So what I address as well will be things that prepare for oral boards. But for the purposes of a multiple choice, it'll be very obvious what you need to make sure you are tied on. Um, so let's go to the diagnosis. We know that this is a chemical serologic diagnosis with uh, chronic excessive secretion of parathyroid hormone from one or more parathyroid glands uh, caused by most commonly a solitary adenoma, uh, um, and then 15% by a diffuse four gland hyperplasia or carcinoma rarely. Let me just uh, say very quickly for carcinoma, this has the very distinct feature of markedly high PTHs in the thousands, high hundreds, uh, uh, aggressive disease because they're not within a anatomic contained area and therefore uh, high local recurrence. Uh, and unfortunately, while the, the recurrence uh, is very uh, aggressive and rapid in some cases because of their uncontained growth and their adjuvant therapy doesn't seem to take care of it, the reason actually why they die is not because of the recurrent disease, they die of uh, malignant hypercalcemia. So in other words, uh, the carcinoma uh, related to the hyperparathyroid is, or hyperparathyroid is related to carcinoma is exactly that clinical feature. We will focus on one and two. Uh, what do you see chemically or uh, serologically? Hypercalcemia and an elevated parathormone level in, in almost every case or uh, incompletely suppressed parathyroid hormone level indicating that it is coming from the parathyroid. Um, historically, uh, before 1970, this was really a diagnosis by symptoms. Uh, this was uh, Captain Martell, a very famous story. Um, a lot of the general surgeons uh, uh, can discuss this uh, off the top of their head because this was a very important story in the endocrine world and we certainly should adopt our understanding of this history as a uh, medical history piece. But this is a patient uh, who uh, went through in this time period from going from uh, the, uh, this, this appearance to this appearance due to his uh, hyperparathyroidism. Uh, the short version is, is that uh, they explored his neck multiple times and couldn't find it. He did his own homework in, in multiple libraries and said, hey, do you go look in my chest. They looked in his chest and they found the adenoma. He later died from laryngospasm uh, uh, when he lost his airway due to his uh, uh, chronic tetany from the hypocalcemia during a procedure to remove a uh, kidney stone. Um, after 1970s, uh, we're not talking about Captain Martell. We are talking about something that, that uh, presents asymptomatically as an incidental finding uh, by your primary care doctor uh, who uh, has ordered a calcium, found it elevated, and subsequently ordered a PTH. And it's at such an early stage of their disease that the patients are asymptomatic. And that is now the uh, centerpiece of our understanding about how to work these patients up, is the asymptomatic hyperparathyroid patient. Different causes of hypercalcemia. This is very important. Even as a surgeon, you don't want to be finding yourselves that that you completely trusted the workup to say that you are now have an indication for surgery. You really need to understand that uh, certain things will cause uh, false positives, at least with a, hy a hypercalcemia, or throw you off in terms of hypercalcemia with elevated uh, parathormone levels. Uh, so uh, in this list, I point to um, many of you recognize what's obviously contributing to hypercalcemia. One of these I point to is FHH, which is the familial hypercalceric hypercalcemia, where the calcium is not only elevated due to decreased uh, excretion through the renal system, but also has elevated parathormone. So that is your one disease that can mimic hyperparathyroidism, but is actually a renal disease. Drugs like thiazide, lithium, vitamin D all cause the uh, uh, calcium to be elevated. Uh, um, and then drop down the renal failure. We know that second and tertiary uh, hyperparathyroidism is a result of renal failure, and we'll touch on that uh, some more. And then uh, true hyperparathyroidism as a cause for hypercalcemia is just a small uh, part of the overall etiology of hypercalcemia. So it's very important that you are in this ballpark of true hyperparathyroidism before you actually operate on these patients. 
Um, establishing the diagnosis starts with the calcium, so repeat studies just to confirm that all both of these are elevated. Other tests that you need to have always uh, available to you because this is your way of avoiding a mistake as a surgeon, right? And this is fundamental is not only the calcium levels and parathormone levels, but making sure they don't have renal failure through the creatinine level, uh, vitamin D level. Uh, we'll talk about that. And finally, 24-hour urine calcium to indicate that you don't have FHH or familial hypocalcemic hypercalcemia. Calcium levels, uh, repeated measurements, normal total serum calcium is this range here, depending on your institution or your laboratory, affected by albumin levels. So we know that low albumin, you need to correct for a low albumin by using this formula. You are all familiar with this. You do all understand that calcium carries the, uh, I'm sorry, albumin can carry the calcium. So you have less albumin than you're carrying less calcium and it can look like an overall lowered number, uh, which in fact your actual active calcium that is not binding to cal uh, albumin may actually be okay, but you just need to figure out whether it is or not through this calculation. Ionized serum calcium, 4.8 to 5.7, not affected by uh, uh, albumin. So this is a more expensive test with a tighter range in numbers that you can use to confirm the hypercalcemia um, and uh, uh, add that to this if you want in terms of your overall assessment. Parathor parathyroid hormone, so this is the second of the five tests. Here's your normal level in picograms, uh, elevated in primary hyperparathyroidism. Normal levels with hypercalcemia suggests hyperparathyroidism. So again, normal levels of parathormia suggest hyperparathyroidism because in all other cases of, of uh, hypercalcemia, the PTH is suppressed, right? So corollary, if the PTH is not suppressed beyond normal, in other words, if it's not suppressed all the way down to below normal, despite the hypercalcemia, then it's probably another cause. And that other cause is non-parathyroid uh, causes of hypercalcemia. So recognize that subtlety. Creatinine levels are important. Chronic renal failure can lead to secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Why? Because vitamin D, which controls calcium levels uh, normally, is converted at three levels, skin, liver, kidney. Its final conversion is in the kidney. So if you have uh, uh, um, diseased kidney, of renal failure, you will reach a point where the uh, kidney does not can make the final conversion of vitamin D. Uh, um, and that final conversion leads to a lack of active vitamin D. And with that lack of vitamin, active vitamin D leads to a drop in the calcium, which then increases the activity of the parathormone to drive the calcium back up. And then you subsequently develop independent parathyroid activity, referred to as tertiary hyperparathyroidism. I will repeat myself on that one. Uh, inactive vitamin D leading to the low calcium, leading to the stimulation of parathyroid activity, and then eventually it becomes autonomous. We can look at this slide. Uh, in primary hyperparathyroidism, on your slide, you can circle this. PTH is driving everything. That's because you have an abnormal solitary adenoma, or you can have all four, but it's primarily coming from an abnormal parathyroid that is then increasing the amount of parathyroid in the system, and then secondarily, the calcium goes up. That's your classic primary hyperparathyroidism. Secondary uh, hyperparathyroidism is the early stages of renal failure, excuse me, where this is your lack of vitamin D conversion. So things start over here. So you can circle this, make this your first step because vitamin D is not being converted, therefore your calcium is low, which is then stimulating your parathyroid to increase in um, production. Okay, so this is secondary hyperparathyroidism. And then tertiary hyperparathyroidism is secondary hyperparathyroidism that has continued so long that eventually it becomes autonomous where now it's over here. This is the driving force. The parathormone is driving things. Uh, it is elevated um, significantly because all four glands are now autonomous. And this autonomous overproduction of parathormone is now driving the calcium up. Um, and this is in the later stages of uh, chronic renal failure. Okay, makes sense? All right. Uh, vitamin D level, your fourth, uh, is this the fourth? Yes, your fourth of, uh, of your five tests. Vitamin D level, uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D has an inverse relationship with parathormone, uh, deficiency of that, and hypocalcemia will both trigger increased uh, parathormone production. Uh, and in primary hyperparathyroidism, uh, vitamin D deficiency is associated with more significant hypercalcemia and bone disease. So it's very important to know if your patient's at risk for vitamin D deficiency. One, because uh, it could be a better explanation for 
uh, their current situation with a slightly elevated parathormone trying to make up for this. Or, and then if you correct their vitamin D, they may normalize. Number two, it also gives you a better idea and a better management of their status after surgery because if you're vitamin D deficient and didn't recognize it, you operate on the patient. And then afterwards you have trouble bringing their calcium up. It's all because you didn't recognize the vitamin D and the patient's now sucking up all that calcium because it's wanting uh, to have more after you got rid of the parathyroid level, but it can't hold on to that uh, good number because you don't have enough vitamin D. So correction of vitamin D deficiency is both important diagnostically and important postoperatively. Um, Oops, hang on, there we go. This is uh, a slide you can always refer to showing the average uh, parathormal level in patients who have uh, a vitamin D deficiency versus the average parathormal level uh, in patients who have normal vitamin D levels. All of these are patients who have primary hyperparathyroidism. So it shows you that patients with primary hyperthyroidism with vitamin D deficiency have uh, average higher parathormal levels. And then your fifth test of the five tests is 24-hour urine calcium levels. What are you ruling out? You're ruling out familial hypocalceric hypercalcemia. Uh, so FHH, autosomal dominant disorder of the renal calcium sensing receptor. Uh, and what you'll see in the 24-hour urine is decreased urine calcium levels, less than 100 milligrams in 24 hours. What does that support? That supports FH, FHH. So all my patients, I'll review all five of these tests to see if they're present. And this is a very important one. If it hasn't been ordered, I will order it. Um, and, um, and then um, look for that persistent elevated excretion to support a true primary hyperparathyroid state. And that if it's the opposite decreased, then we move away from the surgery and consider the fact that this is indeed um, a FHH condition. So there's your five, establishing the diagnosis and ruling out other. Now let's talk about the key history questions. As I showed you with thyroid, there's questions my residents know they must ask, is the patient symptomatic? Is there a history of radiation exposure? Is the patient on lithium or thiazide diuretics? Does the patient have a significant family history? Those four questions. So first question, uh, is the patient symptomatic? This leads to the moans, groans, stones, and hypo, uh, uh, psychic overtones. GI, anore anorexia, nausea, vomiting, ulcerous pancreatitis. By the way, this is a result of the fact that calcium activates pepsinogen and trypsinogen to pepsin and trypsin. Therefore, if you have an increased activation of the enzyme, you'll have an increase as a pancreatitis. Just a little fact there for you. But uh, musculoskeletal disease where there's uh, nonspecific pain of the muscles uh, in the area of the long bone. Uh, stones, very uh, helpful. This is one of the criteria that supports our decision to operate. Anybody has a stone that has primary hyperparathyroidism, even though they're asymptomatic, in other words, they have an a incidental stone in their renal uh, uh, pelvis, uh, then they should get surgery for their hyperparathyroidism. Um, neuropsych, um, there's a lot of stories around, and I've seen it over and over and over again, where the patient undergoes the parathyroidectomy and the significant other uh, who sees, sees them in the post-op period will actually turn to me and says, thank you for giving me my husband back. I go, well, how did I do that? And he goes, well, he's a lot less cranky and he's doing a lot better on Jeopardy. Um, it's one of my favorite stories I repeat over and over again. And various variations to that story are very real. These patients have a very subtle, they're off sort of story. And once you normalize them, they actually have a return of their overall neurologic and uh, neuropsych status. Um, the symptoms of the moan, stones, groans, and psychic overtones remind you uh, of the symptoms that one can have. Second question, radiation exposure, just like thyroid, that's a very important question. Exposure radiation uh, and of the three types, risk for primary hyperparathyroidism as much as 40 years later. Thyroid cancer risk with radiation exposure should be considered in patients with concomitant primary hyperparathyroidism in a thyroid nodule. This is an interesting comment that repeats itself. Uh, I have to tell you, I've never seen this yet. Doesn't mean I have that robust of a practice to fall into the type of numbers that eventually this can show. Uh, but it's certainly a nice little clinical vignette, at least for you to know practically. I don't know how much you need to know that uh, specifically for the purposes of the boards. Um, medication, what medications, this is a good question. What are the following medications uh, will uh, uh, predispose a patient to uh, uh, hyperparathyroidism uh, or hypercalcemia? Uh, lithium, uh, we'll do this uh, by elevating parathormal levels uh, 